Uh, first off, yeah, I'm a founder or visionary of the OPC Foundation. Started it a long, long time ago in 1995. And my whole vision's been about interoperability and making competitors essentially work together. So we started off really in the OT world and solving the problem of taking data and information from you know, basically the factory floor and from process control and then basically migrating that up to what I call the first tier visualization applications. So from a foundation perspective, we're, we're an international standard, we're IEC, and we're basically you know, in the mode of delivering and getting competitors equipment working together. And that's been the whole focus. Whether the competitors like it or not, the real world is that you know, the end users expect interoperability. And particularly when you start thinking about it you know, from an overall perspective of, you know, we, we expect products should be reliable, they should really be plug and play. The biggest challenge that the foundation has though is unfortunately, and if you're from Europe, that's wonderful, but Europe seems to dominate the landscape in terms of adoption of standards and specifically because of things like Industry 4.0 and all the regional equivalents, the government keeps putting lots of money into these organizations basically for the purpose of making sure that the manufacturers really start doing and building products that work together. And they're trying to be very competitive in you know, all aspects of industrial automation. So the interesting thing is my board of directors you know, includes small companies, right? Like Microsoft and SAP and Rockwell and Schneider and ABB and Yokogawa and the list goes on. But it's interesting because these are the companies that are really driving and delivering technology based on open standards. So I, the, we, we like to think that we have the largest ecosystem for industrial interoperability. These are the companies that actually build you know, products based on the technology. My focus really is about collaboration and making sure that we can deliver data and information from all these different things. I don't care if it's the edge, I don't care if it's the cloud, I don't care of what different type of system it is. A lot of people are using Raspberry Pis as you know, controlling devices in OT. You can do this now, and the concept is with open standards, we've got the ability to actually take data and information and make it useful and basically do a convergence between IT and OT. And that's kind of the model behind it. So my whole real focus though, and I apologize for this eye chart, it's kind of my, my overall architecture, but basically we know that technology keeps changing. I measure success by the level of adoption of technology. I apologize to anybody who's in academia here. I apologize particularly to Jeff. Um, but the concept is that you know we're trying to do things where really the end users want the technology and the suppliers will go build products based on the technology and deliver products that are useful, okay? And there's a lot of classic cases that have been happening over the years with small companies like ExxonMobil that finally decided we're tired of being locked into a single vendor. I won't mention who the vendor is, but they were tired of being locked into that single vendor and they said, you know what, we're gonna go build our own open control system from a hardware and software perspective. And they're doing that based on open standards and they're doing it because they can. And they hired a company called Lockheed Martin that at the time knew nothing about the industry of oil and gas, but they said, we're gonna go, if we can hire these guys and we're gonna teach them about oil and gas, we can solve the problem, it'll be based on open standards. What I do know is that the technology keeps changing. You know, I don't care if it's Apple, I don't care if it's Microsoft, I don't care if it's Amazon, I don't care if it's Google. The technology keeps changing. And the most important thing is we can keep adapting to the, techno to the technology, okay? And that's the most important thing. You know, with everything going on in the world right now, we're trying to adapt quickly to a lot of different things. And we need to be able to leverage the best technology that actually makes sense to use. So my architecture is built on a whole model of you know, basically collaborating with a lot of other standards organizations. So we do things in building automation. I do things in oil and gas. I do things in pharmaceutical. I do things in water treatment. By the way, you don't say wastewater. It's called water treatment now. Do not say wastewater. That's a bad way of paraphrasing that. But the concept is you know, basically I've got you know, my smart device out here and it's not a smartphone, 
Remember that, because it's an information portal. That's how you know the students, and that's how our children, our grandchildren, use the technology, because they don't use it as a phone. They use it as an information portal to get different information, basically, and make it useful information to do simple applications, like I want to find out how to go from point A to point B. And in manufacturing, I want to basically do preventative maintenance. And I want to use this as a way of doing predictive analysis and do things where I can intelligently make sure that my line doesn't go down because I've got the appropriate data. So um, security is very important in everything we're doing. OPCUA stole it. We stole it from the retail and financial community. I won't go into all the details about this. My presentation will be available. But the concept is, with all these IoT devices and all these edge devices, we have to make sure they're secure. You have to make sure, you may want to share information with her, but you want to restrict and figure out what information you want to share. And that's very important. With all these great IoT protocols that are out there, we open the door, but there's no security. Oh, great, great. And I'm not talking about encryption, I'm talking about authentication, and actual, you know, deciding who is the right person to be able to use that information. So that's the whole thing we've built in the architecture. I talk about interoperability, I talk about data modeling. You know, if you think about what we've been doing for a long period of time, I take digital images all the time, and I used to ask this question 10 years ago. I said, so, you know, I've got this anethyl, and I want to find out, you know, I want to find all the digital images over the last five years that had anethyl in. Okay, well, before facial recognition came in, there was no easy way of doing that. With facial recognition, it provides indexing, which I actually call metadata, and that's the metadata behind the image, which then allows me to quickly find an ethyl. Well, if I'm thinking about an industrial automation facility, I want to do the same thing. I want to find every place that a valve is being used. I want to find out when it was open, when it was closed, how much throughput went through the valve at any point in time. And that's called metadata that's actually stored with all the object. And security is built into the architecture we're doing. So the biggest thing is, everybody's talking about Industry 4.0. How, how many people have heard of Industry 4.0? OK, is there anybody that hasn't? Thank goodness. OK, OK, there's a couple of people, a couple of people. Or they're just humoring me. Well, Industry 4.0 started in Germany, basically, as a mechanism to essentially, and they'll tell you this, to compete with manufacturing outside of Germany. They basically want to be able to do custom-made manufacturing, and the concept is if we can do this based on open standards, and we can do this in a way that we can do you know, custom-made cars and custom-made anything, you know, and everything based on demand, we've done the right thing. Well, there's Industry 4.0, there's a lot of other knockoffs. For example, in China, it's called Made in China 2025. They're going to roll it out the end of next year, actually. Uh, in, in Korea, there's the Smart Manufacturing you know, Initiative. In France, it's called Industry to Future, and so forth. But the concept is all of the governments, basically, are putting a lot of money into, essentially, Industry 4.0, or their regional equivalent, because they want to dominate the landscape in terms of you know, having their companies that are basically producing products be best to breed and produce quality products. Here in the US, we've got an initiative called SESME. Um, it, it has to do with Clean Energy and Smart Manufacturing Institute. And I think there's a colleague in the room someplace that's here. Maybe, maybe not. OK, he's over there. OK, haven't met him yet. But uh, they're trying to do this in the US, basically where they're going to actually develop a lot of things, where they're developing a complete infrastructure that allows a lot of things in the US and all the US manufacturers, essentially, funded by the federal government to essentially be able to dominate and be able to build products based on technology for interoperability. So Germany, my German colleagues are very proud of this. You know, uh, OPCUA was recognized by Industry 4.0. So if you want to build an Industry 4.0 product, you have to use OPCUA. I pull through a lot of other standards organizations because of that, because we do both data modeling and communication. Um, my Chinese guys, and I have no idea why I was putting my hand up there, but it was the right thing to do in China, but basically, when we developed the OPCUA specification and made it a Chinese national standard. Um, from a, a domain perspective, though, you have to think about what I'm talking about. In pharmaceutical versus oil and gas versus water treatment, they all have their different domains. Building automation is a different domain. There's a lot of different devices out there, 
but they all really have the same type of things that they want to get out of them. I want to get data and be able to use that data as intelligent information. I don't know anything, well, I do, but I don't have to know anything about building automation. I don't have to know anything about water treatment. I don't have to know anything about serialization and track and trace in the pharmaceutical industry. But what I do want to know is I want to provide a mechanism that allows interoperability across all these different devices that are out there independent of what the domain is. And that really is what OPC is trying to do, basically helping all these other organizations build companion specifications which takes their data from a pharmaceutical device or from a water treatment or from an oil and gas, okay, or from a building automation system and can aggregate this data into useful information and then get it across from the OT into the IT world. That's why SAP is so interesting. In so if you think about how we used to have to teach robots, we used to have to teach robots through complex programming. Now with adaptive learning and basically doing a lot of what's known as VR, I can do these things dramatically. Sorry, VR stands for virtual reality. But I can actually wear you know, a virtual reality device and I can actually move my hands and I can now coordinate and teach the robot to do the simple operations that I need to do, like welding of you know, joints on a car. That's the kind of thing, instead of you know, doing this in some cryptic programming way, that's the kind of mechanism. So what we're trying to do now is we want to have all these machines be able to learn how to talk to each other. So I want robots to be able to start sharing information and telling information so that they can actually work together in a seamless fashion. And if you think about what USB has done in the consumer electronics, I'm trying to do the same thing in industrial automation and building automation, where essentially it's plug and play. I plug something in, it gets recognized, I can find out what I can do with this device, and magically it can work. Same thing that's happened with USB. So if you think about this, the vendors then start differentiating based on the features and functionality versus the interfaces between talking together. And that's kind of the standard behind it. And I don't want to go into all these gory details, but this is the type of industries that OPC is basically embracing. We collaborate with all these different organizations, essentially, that do things for their specific domain, or they do things specifically for you know, their particular you know, networking infrastructure. And that's what OPC is about. And then working with organizations like SESME and IIC and Industry 4.0, we can actually tie all these things together and actually solve the problem that the end users really want. So up there in the, uh, in the far, I guess it's the left-hand corner for you guys, the Open Group. The Open Group is basically an organization that hosts another organization called the Open Process Automation Forum. Go look those guys up. And the reason I tell you to look, go look those up is because this is where ExxonMobil said, we're done, we got to make this work, we're not going to be locked into a single supplier, we want answers, we want the systems to work, we want our data and information to be reliable and secure, end of story, go make this work. And essentially they're developing their own standard based on existing standards out there because of the level of frustration that they had. Namur happens to be an end user organization out of Europe very highly focused in the German market, and essentially they're Audi and BMW and Tesla and their Volkswagen, and they're doing the same thing. They're saying, you know what? End users are speaking. We have a group of end users that are demanding interoperability, security, and reliability, and those are the kind of things going on. So this just spans pretty much all the, the other things going on. And again, the consortia are the Industry 4.0 and the Industry 4.0 knockoffs. So what's the future? So I've got a really long eye chart of all kinds of stuff that I envisioned that I wanted to do over the next few years. And you'll probably hear shortly that I am uh, finally actually am going to step down from OPC. It's time to retire, time to go do something different. And I've got a new gig that I'm going to go do, and you'll hear about that later on. Again, it'll be quite visionary and let it go at that. It'll be kind of exciting of what I've uh, started to go do. So the uh, field level communications is an initiative where essentially if you know anything about the industrial automation arena, there's a ton of different networks out there, 223 to be exact, that I happen to know about. Well, everybody's frustrated with that, particularly the suppliers. 
they're frustrated with having so many different networks all owned by a single vendor or a multitude of vendors and now they basically chosen a technology called OPC way over TSN and TSN I recognized about five years ago as a game-changing technology um, and 5G is the next step that also the foundation is going to embrace. If you haven't heard of TSN, go take a look at it. It's the network inside of the automotive bill, okay? That was the first time. It's called time-sensitive networking. And basically, it gives us the safety and security necessary to do, you know, essentially the autonomous vehicles. And now TSN is going to be a relevant technology now for factory automation and essentially for everything related to, you know, any sort of process automation applications as well. So that's what's going on there. And there's a lot of different brochures. Uh, we pride ourselves in making sure that we translate everything into every possible language as necessary. And there is a French brochure up there as well. You can go from there. So. I wanted just to go briefly, give you kind of an idea of what we're trying to do. I measure success, again, by the level of adoption. I don't like doing academic things. I have a standard rules that, you know, the technology we know changes so fast, and we know the buzzwords change so fast, okay? We've been doing cloud for a long time. I've been doing cloud for 10 years, okay? And now everybody's talking about it. Everybody's been talking about big data the last four years. We've been doing big data for 10 years as well. Okay, it's just the name has changed a little bit. So I preach basically a vision of that I want to make everybody work together. I do everything based on, you know, the concept of interoperability. I know that in consumer goods, we expect this stuff just to work out of the box. And the same now is really true in industrial automation. Okay, and companies like SAP and Oracle and Google and Amazon are now setting the benchmark for trying to get data into their respective clouds. And the big thing we're trying to do is all these applications to streamline operation and make it easier and easier, you know, to basically do things. I'll tell you a little story about pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical uh, basically has been in a struggling uh, arena for a period of time because of all the counterfeit drugs, okay, coming out of certain particular regions. Well, the mechanism behind that is called serialization or track and trace. And the concept is every single pharmaceutical will have an individual serial number on, which you think about how is that affecting the whole packaging arena and how we need to start doing things. Now, the same is true in packaging for single goods, right? Everybody wants to have things isolated and basically, you know, put into single units of consumption. So with all this different technology, we're looking at strategies to do that and actually to basically, by getting all the vendors to work together in a cooperative fashion, we can actually do things and solve problems more quickly. So with that, I'll stop there. Other qu questions?